Okay, we're live. Okay, welcome everybody. Yeah, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Research Software Hour Session 3. Hi, Richard. Hi. Glad everyone can be here. So I guess you know how this goes by now. Hopefully we have some new people here this week. So if you're new here, Research Software Hour is sort of a way that we want to be able to reach people in a more informal setting. So you can basically see and hear how we work every day and then hopefully pick up some tips and tricks and get the spirit of programming and research software. Yeah, and hopefully we can share some of our joy, some of our troubles. Uh, hopefully we get lots of questions. Um, yeah, we, uh, we decided this time to keep the intro very short. So Richard from Helsinki, uh, my name is Harovan Stromso. Uh, we work within high performance computing, but also read code, write code, and work with researchers on writing better resource software. Mm -hmm. We have the HackMD, which is the best place to ask questions because it's easier for us to follow than the, than the chat on Twitch. Yeah. You can find the HackMD document uh, if you scroll below the below the screens, below the video, there is a link. Yeah. I can see six people are online. If you visit the page, please ask questions at the bottom of the document. Also, please answer other people's questions. You can edit by uh, uh, clicking top left on the, there's this little pen where you can uh, switch to edit mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a reminder, this video will be put on YouTube afterwards, and all the HackMD questions will also be put there. Yes. So we always touch these to the uh, to the last session so that you can find find them again. Mm -hmm. So, well, I guess we should get started, right? Let's get started. So, yeah. just a preview. Today we talk about uh, dependencies. There will be, comp but more about the compile time dependencies. We will talk about versioning. We will also talk about documentation and we have a guest, right? Yes. So today, well, last week we were talking about dependencies and there were some questions related to what happens if you don't manage dependencies well. And there's one person I thought about, about when we mentioned that, and that's my colleague, Simo Tuomisto. So Simo's in charge of building software for our cluster, not the only person, but probably the one that goes deepest into it. And well, I thought he could come and give us some thoughts on what happens when you have messy dependencies. So Simo, you're here now. Hi. Hey. Hi. So thank you me. for letting me be here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so cool thank you for the nice words. Yeah. Compliments. <laughs> yeah. So um, maybe can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, what do you do for, well, um, either for so, a living or for software stuff on our cluster? Yeah, so mainly in, in Alto, like a lot of my work or most of my work is related to solving like researchers' problems with the software that they have. So because we have a, quite a big user space, uh, a lot of different users in diff different kind of situations, uh, and they use different kind of software, they quite often end up uh, having problems with said, uh, said software, like optimizing the software, installing the software, using it. And, mm -hmm. and that's where I usually come in, uh, that when our users have a problem with uh, such software, I try to, well, solve it for them <laughs> and try yeah. to serve them in that sense. Yeah. And often that involves spending a lot of time trying to get some something running. Yeah, like my, I usually say that, like it's better that one person who likes, who like uh, collects the information and then tries to distribute it with mm -hmm. other users because not everybody needs to like encounter the same problem, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. like starting from scratch. Like, yeah, it's it's better that somebody like uh, aggregates the information about the, those mm -hmm. problems and distributes the information mm -hmm. then forward. Yeah. So what happens when someone releases software with messy dependencies? What are the kinds well, of things that can go wrong? Well, the, the first uh, thing that usually happens is that that it creates like a 
uh, barrier of usage for that software. So, so yeah, actually, dependency issues aren't necessarily like uh, uh, they aren't uh, technical issues more than more than they are usability issues. So, instantly it's like a uh, hidden inside this the shell of technical details. And there's actually a usability issue. So, so when when people release this kind of software, it creates like a barrier between the developer of the software and users of the software. So when when uh, depend like something, some software that doesn't have uh, the dependencies mm -hmm. well defined uh, is released, and some user wants to use it, they, they there's like a translation process of what the, actually the software is trying mm -hmm. to do, and yeah. how do how can I accomplish in my system or in my computer or, mm -hmm. or with the tools I have. So it's basically like a translation process and as you know like with any translation process there's huge risk of mistranslating the information and, and that, that's basically the, the thing that like uh, whenever mm -hmm. there's a uh, software that's badly like the dependencies aren't clearly defined you easily end up in a situation where uh, where you can't get it to work mm -hmm. uh, your colleagues can't get it to work some other like mm -hmm. researcher who, will, who who would like to replicate the results they can't get it to work and um, and maybe you you yourself can't get it to work after a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. So yeah, and very so often, that, very often we see that later. So not yeah, maybe during yeah. the development, and, but and once the software hits the into the world. Yeah, and especially like the, these dependency issues, they are a bit like um, uh, uh, yeah, it's basically like you 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 take out whatever you bought, uh, you take it out of the box, and you throw the manual away, and when <laughs> the thing breaks. Uh, you don't know you no longer know how to fix it so that that's mm -hmm. basically what happens if you don't like keep track of what the software actually needs and uh, what kind of uh, support it needs mm -hmm. and what uh, if i can ask what are what are some of the like more common pitfalls that you see well uh there's there's few things the, the first one is is like trivial that you don't list the dependencies so so of course like that's that's that you just mm -hmm. say that okay this is like something that needs to be uh, that just should work and it doesn't. And that's quite often, that might be the case. But uh, more often you end up in two two different situations. But either either you have a, a software that lists uh, installation instructions that are like very, um, how could I describe it? Like we're very uh, through, thorough, mm -hmm. in, like run these commands, these kind of install, uh, installation instructions. But those commands are not universal. So basically, mm. uh, when the when whoever wants to install the software, they try to run those commands. But it's not like possible yeah. to necessarily run the same mm. commands if you if you try to run it in Windows or if you try to run it in Mac mm. or different distributions. Even Windows, the older so. version or something. Yeah, like, yeah, it, not it the very they, latest bleeding edge. Yeah, like ma many of our users, uh, like they to run pip install something for example mm -hmm. and and that doesn't work unless you're running in a virtual environment or you okay. add a user flag there so that they, they, they are not trying to install it uh, as sudo mm -hmm. so that kind of like like mm -hmm. having clear instructions that seem like they should work but th they actually don't uh, like tell you mm -hmm. what you're trying to install they don't mm -hmm. tell you what to install they just tell you how you should be doing it and mm -hmm. then you end up in this xy problem that you probably have uh, mm -hmm. you at yeah. least know about it that basically you then uh, you try to solve over why don't i get this pip install to work instead of like trying mm -hmm. to get the actual software working you're trying to work on the dependencies and that that's quite common that mm -hmm. you end up in this situation where you're not explicitly saying what are the dependencies you're just saying how the dependencies should be installed and that's that's two different things oh yeah yeah and and our other other thing that might be uh, quite common is like you hard code too much like mm -hmm. like you have implicit uh, instructions in your uh, installation instructions where you don't give it, give let's say the user enough leeway, uh, so that they can uh, like switch some pieces uh, mm -hmm. underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the basically the pseudonyms, uh, like the bad bad or the uh, frustrating situation for pseudonyms. Like when we would try to like switch one part of the software to some other uh, dependency that that we want to use. So mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, 
let's say your software requires basic linear algebra algebra uh, libraries, so the plus libraries. Mm -hmm. There's multiple different distributions of those libraries. And if we want to use the version we have installed that we already have, then some software is like, okay, you should use the hard coded version. And that's mm -hmm. that shouldn't be that way. It should be that the user should uh, have the leeway of changing these mm -hmm. dependencies based on their own. Uh, yeah. like, For me as a developer, it can be sometimes a difficult balance because on one hand, I'm told that I should pin the dependencies. But then on yes. the other hand, I should also keep them a little bit flexible so that they don't create trouble for those installing them. Yes. Yeah. Like I, I think that the, like the middle ground should be that you should uh, like maybe describe what dependencies you re really need, like mm -hmm. certain version numbers, certain like, like, okay, I need uh, between this and this, like these versions, I, I've tried these versions, uh, these should work and then give mm -hmm. maybe instructions on how you should do them on this system, for example. Like, a, let's say you ha you use Ubuntu, and then, then you can give yeah. a, a shell script that does it in Ubuntu. But that shouldn't be the only way of installing the software. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. It's, uh, like like you said, it's it's like a delicate balance between yeah. uh, hard coding everything. Like you should do this mm -hmm. like that, and then uh, like not making it possible at, at all. Yeah, that's a really good tip. I that's a really good tip. I will also adopt that. Do you have any other uh, tips of what um, developers can do to minimize trouble? Uh, for... Yeah, one one thing that's like a workflow tip. Uh, I usually give uh, users who create, for example, they create Python environments, and Python environments have this bad habit of, especially like with uh, even with Conda environments, that once you install more stuff on top of it, you end up in this. Windows 98 situation at some point that you need to just erase everything and start from scratch, <laughs> like like this olden times. And at and, and that point, it can be like gruesome to to go back uh, and look at your dependencies. I, I think the best way is usually to like, whenever you uh, like consciously know that, okay, I will need Pandas or I will need uh, Matplotlib for this functionality, mm -hmm. then add it to uh, your dependency list like, like have a list of dependencies and then afterwards you can check out whether those versions are actually needed. But like having this kind of a work done during the development process is really important because then mm -hmm. it, it, it reminds you what, what you like assume to be uh, by default. Mm -hmm. another, another good example, uh, like uh, I'm gonna say a good hint for users is to, is to abide by the standards because like, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, even big software can have problematic, for example, CMake fields yeah. because, uh, like, they have a they they bring their own CMake modules. They they bring uh, like so they set environment variables hard coded so you can't overwrite them. You you have lots of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, lots of uh, third party stuff coming with the repositories and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and and that can like of course if you're a big project. And you have bended basically the the <laughs> installation system to your wheel. That's okay, but but if you're starting a new project, it would be a better way to like abide by standards because then uh, everybody who like like because I don't I don't know those software necessarily. I don't use those. Yeah, software, exactly. But, but I I know the standards, and then I can like uh, transfer that information to mm -hmm. the new system. So like a like a good configure script is amazing because like, you can immediately like. Run, run it with help and and see what requirements it has, mm. and you can give it them with with flags, and uh, you get everything mm. done really simply. Like abiding the, by the standards gives people the ability to like uh, share yeah. or use their like already existing knowledge when they're doing the installation. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one problem is that mm. of course many, many researchers are maybe not aware of the standards, so I think that's why it's also important yeah. that we collaborate with research software engineers and yeah. so yeah. that we can yeah. help. And I, I admit, like I haven't read out the tools manual. Like it's, it's, it's so big. Like it's five hundred <laughs> pages or something. Like I, yeah. I looked at it today just, just to like go through it, and, and it's, it's really big. And, and mm -hmm. like I don't even know what are the C, uh, CMAX standards. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, at some point you just need to, uh, like if you're starting a new yeah. project, it might be a good idea to look at some other projects and see how they are doing them, yeah. and like try to abide by this, like the yeah. same kind of language that other people use. I guess you could say sort of don't be too clever. So if you yes. need to change your build system to 
make it yes. work for your software, maybe change your software to make it work with the build system. Yes, yes, definitely. Because the build system authors have probably thought about this a lot more than you have somehow. Yeah. Yes, that, that mm -hmm. same, same goes with, let's say, Python um, like packages. That yeah. It might be a good idea to figure out how people packages the packages like you don't mm -hmm. necessarily want to write setup pies for everything you might want mm -hmm. to like uh, make it a bit more robust so that you know how it can be done one yeah. good example of like software that's that's actually really good packages is Arda software mm -hmm. like uh, Arda software mm -hmm. uh, everything is written with GNU automate so so yeah. it will always give you an like um like a uh, error when it says that okay mm. some library is missing and then it will usually mm. give two or three hints at what mm. what library you should be installing mm -hmm. and then uh, it will like do the builds for you so it's it's actually yeah. a very robust system and uh, yeah. that's something to that like it's a good example if you're using an auto make and auto tool yeah so there are several questions from the hack md the first yeah. is specifying dependence for dependencies for a project tends to be quite language dependent for example, requirements.txt in Python. Is there a language independent way to make your dependencies clear and easily usable? Mm, that's pretty rough. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, a good question. So... Like, like there are like tools that are try to do that. Let's say Bazel, like Bazel, mm. uh, this build system that mm -hmm. tries to be like even platform independent. It it tries yeah. to like contain all all kinds of information to the build system itself, so that mm -hmm. you can give it like pretty uh, abstract requirements. Yeah. Mm, I'm not completely certain if you can. Yeah, I, I usually like I'd say that like knowing what you're using and, and just describing it can be uh, just as important as like, mm. yeah, you, you can necessarily can't automate all of these like requirements, yeah. but adding them like, let's say, um, for example, uh, I was installing this one software for our users uh, using our, like we have this automated mm -hmm. build system that we use and uh, and the system or the build actually required Veeam common. So it required the Veeam uh, editor because <laughs> it used some, uh, some obscure uh, like hex, hex edit stuff from the, in the installation step to create mm -hmm. manuals and stuff like that. And I was like, okay like this is something that the users or the developers probably never like intended to do like mm -hmm. to be uh like a uh like a dependency they didn't mm -hmm. even realize that it was a dependency mm -hmm. uh, for the build environment because like everybody has been on the system but mm -hmm. our build system didn't have so uh, mm -hmm. it's it's usually just good idea to list what you know and then when you don't know uh well you don't know that it's like the unknown unknowns like you, mm -hmm. you can't know that you don't know stuff yeah uh, one one good thing that you might try uh like is to use docker just for the build you, you don't even have to distribute the software for that but but if you use docker to build the system because docker images they are like the minimal minimum base operating system image because uh mm. because yeah they're, they're not they're meant for web servers and other stuff yeah. like that they don't contain any packages. So mm -hmm. if you have some, so like, like, yeah, yeah if you have everything. your own, yeah, yeah, if you have your own like laptop and you have used it for four years, you have installed all kinds of stuff that you don't even think mm -hmm. about. And mm -hmm. when you're developing software on that laptop, yeah, of course everything works. But then you, when you distribute distribute mm -hmm. it in the internet and some other person is like, I can't get it to work, yeah. then you realize <laughs> that there are lots of like assumptions that you made, even though you didn't know you made mm -hmm. them so uh, building stuff inside these docker images might be a good idea to like yeah. uh, test test out do, do i really know that my commands do what they are supposed to do and do i really know that yeah uh, uh, like the and uh, i guess software i'm yeah. going to install it works as it does i guess similar with some of the cloud ci systems like travis ci <laughs> yeah. like it yeah. starts with a minimum yeah. system that has nothing yes in there yeah adding, adding like okay. using travis or something like that for your system is yeah. really good like some auto tests uh mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. test test it out it's really really good yeah. because then you have it well documented and yes. there is no like it works on my machine it doesn't work on your mm -hmm. machine because yeah. we, we are talking about the same computer yeah. and and like yeah. having having that kind of systems also is, is a documentation in and of itself like mm -hmm. uh like when mm -hmm. you see this kind of like uh, 
Docker files, for example, for some software, you might see that okay, even though I don't, I could run these in Docker, I can just run them on my computer, and I know that I should get similar systems. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's it's like uh, trying to solve these issues. Uh, well, when you're developing them or thinking about them, it's usually a good way to mitigating them. Yeah. So there was another question. Does Meson or Scons make things easier compared to auto tools or make file or CMake? So sorry, which two? Meson, oh, yeah, yeah. or Scons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like I I personally haven't used them, but I know that they are very popular in in, in the industry. Like uh, mm -hmm. in scientific software, I think yeah, here, here we uh, I think we see uh, like a jump between uh, uh, what scientific software people use and what I'm used to do, <laughs> doing because I've been working with the scientific software so much. Like I haven't used those tools because uh, the scientists themselves haven't used them. So, and that's of course a problem uh, also moving mm -hmm. from me to the scientists. But but I know that uh, in, in the industry, uh, stuff like Meson and Scones are very widely used. Also the Basel like you see that Google uses them and uh, and Facebook mm -hmm. and everybody uses them, but yeah. uh, so 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 of course they are usable, but they are ne not necessarily the stuff used by scientists. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. but so but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be used. Like if mm -hmm. you have the energy to to learn those systems, it's very useful to do it because of course it will help you if you ever want to go to industry. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you will contribute better tools to towards the researchers because mm -hmm. like if every researcher uses CMake for their build system uh, that means that CMake will propagate throughout the, uh, the, the scientific fields and, yeah, uh, I see and... CMake are getting a lot of traction and uh, yeah. of course there is also a lot of make files and auto tools yeah yeah, yeah. Some like, 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 yeah, some yeah if, if, if you want to be the change in the <laughs> software a system I, mm -hmm. I would recommend like uh, learning these new tools and, and using them because then mm -hmm. yeah. like people haven't developed them for nothing they have developed <laughs> them so that they can uh, more easily build the systems like, mm -hmm. like let's say in in a, yeah. in a big yeah yeah it, they're definitely useful yeah so I have some more thoughts about uh, dependencies and compilation but didn't want to interrupt here um, yeah. Uh, Richard, do we have more questions mm. to see more? Otherwise, we want to see yeah. how to hang around a bit because we talk more. We have a little bit more about versioning and yeah. Mm. This is before we come to the like question and answers session. Yeah. Mm. There's one question already answered in the Hackpad about where uh, code and libraries can be published, but there's some journals, and I think it's clear enough in the Hackpad we should save time and go on. Maybe we can come back to it at the end. Yes. So, yeah, with that uh, said, mm -hmm. um, should we go on to the next section? Let's do that. So thanks so, thanks so much, Simo. And uh, yeah. please stay with us until um, until we come to questions and answers, because there will yeah. be more about some more points. Yeah. yeah also, sure. Richard, if you can give me the screen share, because I wanted to yeah. connect uh, a bit to the last session. OK, you're there. All right, uh, I'm here on our GitHub repo, RSH nodes. Just want to say that we got here, we got feedback and some clarifications, and I, I wanted to say how much I appreciate. So we got a follow up. Uh, last time we talked about bit requirements or text, and we got a few more tool recommendations. I didn't know them, so I really appreciate mm. also some mm -hmm. clarification. So uh, I was, I had, it was not very clear to me until now mm. that. Uh, that V and F and virtual F are not exactly the same thing, and and there is something wrong mm. here. So I appreciate, I appreciate yeah. a lot. Yeah, I had a few more thoughts, or not not so much answers, but a few more questions that I ask myself when I look at uh, versioning and the dependencies of compiled languages. Because with comp compiled languages, there is so we have compilers, we have compiler versions, we have it's often MPI, we have libraries, we have the build system, CMake. I think that, uh, and so one, one question that we can start with, so how do we track libraries? It can be our own library, somebody else's libraries. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is so not so not so different from Python and, and, and R and other languages. I think the difference is that 
whereas the newer languages like Python and R and, and Rust and uh, JavaScript, uh, they, have, uh, they have their package management and they have a good dependency management. And there is no doubt about it. Like for Python, it's pip. And for everything that is like semi-Python but can be something else, it's, it's Anaconda. And for, for Rust, it's mm -hmm. uh, Grades, et cetera. But I think the one problem is that for the older languages, C, C++, Fortran, there is no really standard place. I heard about this Conan, which I haven't tried, Conan.io, which is advertised as the C, C++ package manager for developers. I haven't used it yet. Mm -hmm. So there are some solutions, but there is no standard solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and facing this, we have now a couple of couple of approaches that I see, and they, they come with their pros and cons, and I wanted to to bring it up here also for discussion. One, one approach is that, so if my project has dependencies, one thing I can do is if I want to be completely reproducible, I can do something which is sometimes called vendoring. So I copy these dependencies into my project. And, and um, I can ask you the, the, the viewers what, what you think about that, what you can, what, what problems do you anticipate? I mean, two problems that can come up is, uh, it can be problematic license wise, mm -hmm. but also if this is your own library, yeah. and maybe you, need, you want to use it in a couple of projects then you will see that it starts diverging. It will be a bit painful to keep it synchronized across your projects. Yeah. So then uh, approach two is composition. So I can compose my project out of out of projects. And one way is uh, through CMake. There is uh, external projects. There are fetch content. So I can fetch libraries from the web from some place into my project at configure time or build time. Mm -hmm. another, another approach is GitHub modules. And I want to show you one example here in my terminal. Uh, here we go. Oh, Git, Git modules. So here, I'm, mm -hmm. this is a project where we are fetching libraries from the web and composing it through Git. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I wanted everybody to think about a little bit is that uh, I recommend everybody to grab, do a Git grab HTTP in your project. And uh, think a little bit about these dependencies. So will they still be there in a few years? Yeah. Because these mm -hmm. can work. We have in fact seen that. So we have, uh, we have done a history inspection and seen that sometimes when I go back in and I want to test a past version of my code, the dependency is not there because somebody renamed the project or, hmm. or, or moved from GitLab to GitHub. So that's one thing I wanted to everybody to think about. Any comments there? I have one more approach. Yeah. I and I guess once you get even more philosophical, there's dependencies on PYPI. And then right. last time we talked about, or two times ago, we talked about putting code on Zenodo. Well, I guess, is there any de dependency system that installs code from there that would be sort of guaranteed to never change and never be removed? I guess already PyPI says it shouldn't remove stuff without cause, but, yeah. you know. So on PyPI, you can, you can remove. Uh, the only mm. thing you cannot do is you cannot reuse the same version okay. later. But you can mm -hmm. remove a project. Mm -hmm. and some other languages they have uh, learned from that, and they cannot remove it. An interesting question about Zenodo. We need to explore that. I yeah. guess you could put like something like a Python wheel on Zenodo. Here I want to yeah. show. Oh, uh, yes, I'm still screen sharing. This yes. is now. This is so uh, CMake fetch content. So here we fetch some code from from some address. But again, we have to be careful. Is will this mm -hmm. thing still be there? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the? What is the? Approach number three that many projects do, they, uh, the, the approach is that, well, I don't stitch my project together with Git or with CMake, but I assume that the dependencies are on the system. So I need to do some detection. I detect libraries. I detect the versions. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they are on the system, I continue. If they are not, I stop. Yeah. But what, what, mm -hmm. what you then want to do still is still probably you want to have an ISO isolation. Again, we talked about that last time, mm -hmm. and I think it would be good to document them somewhere. One thing we one thing we can do with compiled languages is to use Conda. 
so then we could document mm -hmm. them in environment.yaml. But as Simo said, already putting in, in a readme, uh, what are the what are the version ranges that I'm depending on will, will already help a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, just just to uh, give a hint to uh, like maybe I'll I'll have to add it to the, your repository, but the tools that uh, that are widely used in scientific software installation are easy build and spec. So we mm -hmm. are using both of them in in also. So basically they are. Uh, packet well not necessarily a package manager because they don't uh, they will compile the software but they're build systems for managing the scientific software build systems <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. like a, a, because uh, you can't really rely on the system libraries in uh, in many uh, scientific software situations for example clusters usually run uh, some very reliable uh, uh, Linux distributions, such as uh, CentOS or, uh, or some other Red Hat variant. Yeah. Red Hat variant, and in those systems, the base uh, libraries are usually very old, so you can't use them. You can't use basically anything from the system libraries. Mm -hmm. uh, so everything has to be built by yourself. Mm -hmm. And those systems basically they they install everything from scratch. And they try to be quite reliable, or like reproducible, but it's it's super complicated because then you end up in a situation where, well, uh, if you, well, you still up and quite often end up in a situation where some some library uh, changes somewhere and then it's no longer the same. Mm -hmm. but, but they awesome. are yeah, yeah, they're great tools and we are using them very mm -hmm. heavily. So it's not only Conda. I forgot to complete about that. So it's also easy build Spark. These can yep. be a nice alternatives to document your dependencies and also rely on the package management. Yes, and and it's really easy to like if you if you use let's say CMake for your installation, yeah. it's really easy to implement your own uh, library uh, or your own like software in these systems. So yeah. basically, you can use those to uh, like you can let users use those to install your software. So I wanted to show they... one more one more thing really quickly because one one more alternative is to put we have mentioned Docker files and containers, so mm. we can we can document our dependencies and we can put them into we can document them in the Docker file and we can create a Docker image, and you can you can put the Docker image on the registry. You can also put the Docker image to upload it to the model. So I wanted to show one interesting problem that we encountered in mm. the Code Foundry project. So this is a Docker file, and we thought that well, this is now reproducible for all eternity, but <laughs> so there was an interesting problem that we found. Mm. So even a Docker file is no guarantee that this will build forever because we have at some point realized that we fetch something from this repository, which, mm. and at some point the person here pulled the plug on it, so this thing disappeared. Mm. Yeah. So a Docker file itself is not enough. Uh, what is maybe the best thing you can do is to create a Docker image, container image, and then save the image. Mm. Then, then I think that's maybe the most reproducible. That have you have you talked about singularity yet not yet no we haven't. yeah uh, well that's that's one uh, like that we use as well like that mm -hmm. uh, that basically like takes all of the like your docker image consists of these di different uh, squash fs layers basically like uh, uh, file system diffs basically like there's a file system, base file system and then you make a diff install some new stuff and so forth there's uh, the singularity basically takes all of these and con like pushes them all together so that you get one uh, singularity image that you can use them to well use uh, install your software on and that's basically as as long as the um, like the hardware side doesn't change that much it's basically uh, like future proof so it it will stay the same so those are possibility of using those as a like a intermediate step or like yeah. or as an end product that okay this is definitely working they have their own uh like a repository as well where you can push the images and share them with other researchers yeah i think we should talk about this so uh, at some next session yeah. to, to have more focus on the containers so mm. take home from my session here was i recommend to to do a git grab http and think a little bit about all these links and i think that's all i wanted to mention so i give back to i give back to richard mm -hmm. yeah so i guess we have one more quick part and then there's the halfway time even though we're a bit over half time so 
This next part was about versioning and in fact, how to name your versions to be precise. Um, I'll switch to my screen here. Um, let's start some here. So if you're releasing software, you have to be able to identify what the release is. So an easy way to do that is version one, version two. Whoa, what's happening here? Uh, version, mm, version one, version two, version three, and so on. But what you tend to see very often is there's version uh, x dot y dot z. So the convention here is that X is a major version, and it only gets changed whenever there's something that's backwards incompatible or some sort of big fundamental change to the software. Then the Y is um, minor changes, so minor releases. So anytime you make a new release with new features, then Y gets increased. So, and then Z is patch level. So basically you make a release and then you find there's bugs in it, then Z gets up, upgraded. Mm -hmm. And because time. we communicate uh, expectations to, the, to those using it, mm -hmm. because when I now see that a number went up, so when Z went up, yeah. I know that well there is a bug fix, but it should still work. Yeah. If the if the Y went up, I it means that I got some new features, but it should mm -hmm. still work with my code. Right. If mm -hmm. if X went up, I can expect that I will have to work on my code to make it work with that new new version. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so yeah. And one criticism I heard of this is that it doesn't necessarily mean anything. So you can say that this is what you mean, but still something could break in a Y version or something um, like there may be minor important things in an X version. And there's no guarantee that the author has the same idea of what's major and minor as you do. But I think it's sort of the best we have. So, um, like there's no reason not to use something like this if you are releasing things. So my question to Radovan and our audience is what about minor utilities that don't have very big changes? So in particular, um, let's say I have a little piece of software, it's a little script, I want to give it a version, but it's so minor that like it's not worth making a 1.0.0 version. It's mm -hmm. if I make a 0 0.1 version, it's probably not going to be increased very much later because it's basically done. What do what do you mm -hmm. do? What I heard from someone was if the script is too small, just make your first release 1.0.0 and go from there and don't worry about it. Yeah, I like to call things 0 0.5.0 just to say that it's not really finished, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but for uh, so for, for very small projects, what can also work is I like to sometimes reference the git hash directly. Mm -hmm. So that's that's, yeah. a, that's a version that is at least persistent unless I rewrite the history. So be be careful about history rewrites because if if somebody refers to the uh, yeah, hash. Mm -hmm. but that's, that's also what I, what I forgot to mention yeah. last in in my section and it connects nicely here. What we do in one project is mm -hmm. we put this into the output of the code. So into the result mm -hmm. output, we put mm -hmm. the git hash. We also put the library versions, the compiler version, the operating system, the CMAC version. So if in three years I find only the output and I have lost the code mm -hmm. and I, I lost everything else, I have only the output, I can still do some archaeology with it and I, I can, I can mm -hmm. get an idea of how this was produced. Yeah. So I recommend it. So to always put the, the git hash into the output of the, of the code and maybe more. But uh, how about you, uh, Richard Seymour, how do you version things that yeah. are too small for semantic versioning? Mm. Yeah, well, oh, so yeah, I, I, I have, 
Yes, you go ahead. In the HackMD, someone suggests calendar versioning. So just give it a date or something. Um, I think in the end, it doesn't matter that much what you use, as long as you use something and actually make it identifiable and make sure it increases as time goes up. Yeah, you know. Also, the semantic version that you just showed here works well for libraries that have interfaces. It works well mm. for interfaces. Sometimes you write something that doesn't really have an interface. It's hard to say what the interface is. Yeah. And then one can maybe it's mm -hmm. it's okay with only two numbers, X yeah. and Y, or only one number. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, just an anecdote about the current calendar versioning. I use I used to do that, but I the reason why I don't do that anymore is that we then were too late with the ver with the release. You know, we were preparing the release and it was 2019, mm -hmm. but then. Then, but then it never got finished, and then in 2020, it feels a bit bad to release something that is called <laughs> 2001. Yeah. So that's why, hmm. with the yeah. semantic version, you can be late with your releasing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess we can look for Q and A here and see if there's anything else before we go on. Yes, there is one question about uh, Git ignore. Uh, do you git ignore every dependency under your external subfolder? Or do you add everything into your repo? So that's maybe connected to this vendoring. So one one option would be to put everything into the repo. Uh, I don't do that normally. Uh, if if you use git submodules, then then git submodule takes care of mm. uh, this ignoring. So I don't know this ignore dirty solution there. Uh, so I've never used that. So I use submodules without that setting. So I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, yeah. Other questions welcome. Has, we... has anyone else here ever tried to install something and just completely failed at it and ended up going on and doing something else? I know I have. Also, I sort of wonder how many people don't want their stuff to be installable. Because if, um, let's see, so if someone can't reproduce their stuff, your stuff, then they can't falsify your work and see all, find bugs in it and find all the problems and you know the paper's out and you're just sort of done with it. I know yeah. I've had this feeling before. I'm not proud of it, but well, it happens. Yeah, I think I've, was, was, go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've personally had uh, had this kind of a situation where I've contrib contributed to a project, but uh, the project doesn't necessarily have a like a well maintained uh, like a system of how the contributions are handled, and in those <laughs> cases, like. I, I really can't keep up with the contribute like how, how my contributions are going to go into the system because I don't know how they are going to be maintained or what is the what are the rules in the system. Mm -hmm. So so adding all kinds of like um, versions, adding all kinds of uh, issues or uh, dependency management or something like that. Uh, usually, well at least for me, it gives a, a peace of mind where you can like just trust the rules and go mm -hmm. with the rules and do what the, everybody else is doing. And yeah. that, that helps uh, to take out a lot of the stress of contributing to a project. Yeah. So I think a lot of projects, they end up dying because they don't have this kind of a structure where people could like easily contribute to them. But of course, it, it's an effort. I mean, I know that. Yes. Uh, so these to do these things properly in a standard way, it, it's an effort. Yes. I'm not more and more using automation for that. So I last last days I was working a lot on GitHub Actions on automatizing these building and packaging. So maybe we could revisit at some point. Two more comments on the chat. So there is also a question of credit. That's a very good point mm -hmm. of being able to give credit and also maybe not right now in the academic system, maybe not really getting credit for having a nicely standard solution and many users. Uh, also the user perspective, if I see something that doesn't at least specify the dependencies, or we may look for an alternative. Yeah, that's yeah. that's like it's a, like the 
yeah, your Richard's uh, mention about like do the users even or the developers do they even want people to use the software? That's a uh, leak, but at the same point, I don't know, might be true. <laughs> but but I think there's uh, at least even more people who are like they would be really glad if people would use the software and they don't necessarily yeah. know that okay why why people aren't mm. using my software yeah. but the issue might be that it's it just too too damn hard like mm -hmm. uh what? like i've been trying to help this one user to to use this uh this uh machine learning med, like model that has been developed i won't name names but but uh like i've been trying to get it to work uh for maybe a week and it it's it, it just doesn't like go it it doesn't it doesn't work yeah so so that's that's pretty disheartening because the user really wants to do his research and and uh use this software and it's it's uh really hard to say like it's, I, even i can't do it uh when the, yeah. the software is it doesn't like it doesn't yeah. fly <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's All right. See. More questions will come. Should we yeah. move on to the next segment? We have yeah, I guess let's 15 minutes left. Carry on. So thanks for dropping by Simo. Um, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're, welcome, so you're welcome to stay yeah. on the call if you want, or otherwise, if you go, that's fine too. So um, yeah, it's up to you. I can stay right. in the call. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Great. Okay. So up next, Radovan had uh, one little easy thing to talk about, which is how to mention code in discussions, like an email or Slack yeah. and so on. So do you want your desktop up? Yes. Okay. Oh, desktop, and uh, it will be really short, and maybe it's yeah. obvious for many, but this is about how to talk about code when you email. I don't know if it ever happened to you that you got an email and the code was attached to the email or, or the code was not there, but the email described, please fetch the code from there and there and please go into that folder and in that file and on somewhere close to line 2000, you will find the problem that I'm talking about. <laughs> and I have got these emails, I have written these emails and there is a better way. Um, and the way I like it these days is when I talk about a specific portion of the code, I go into the code. So there's something I was writing on the last days. And if, if I have a question about a specific section, then I can highlight it and I can even give a range. So if I'm talking here about the lines 77 to 83 minus line 83, and I will zoom in in a moment. Yeah. So hopefully this is this is mm -hmm. here visible. So it becomes yellow. Yep. There. And now I can send somebody the link. I will try something now. I will try to I'll try to do this. Oop. Hopefully you will not get seasick, but <laughs> I can. Where is it? Where is the browser? Here. There. So on top, I get a line that I can send to somebody. And they open it up and they see the segment. Oh, one little. Also, we don't have to, I don't have to ask again, like which branch are you talking about? Mm -hmm. uh, because I can see it here. It's the master branch. But uh, yeah. question to everybody, what do you think will happen if I open that email in three weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So what will happen is maybe the code has evolved and then these these now the same lines will be highlighted but now there is a different code portion so even better is to go here and go on permalink mm -hmm. and the oh. permalink uh, if i now manage to scroll up here with my zoomer it puts the thing in the url it puts no. it into my yeah the buffer into my uh, buffer mm -hmm. Oof, nice not i will uh i will turn off the zoom but um, what is now maybe super super tiny is that I get the precise hash. So this will this will always be the same code version unless somebody changes the history. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more feature which is nice to know about when you get such a link, you can open this git blame terrible name <laughs> for historical reasons. It's not for blaming anybody. 
it should have been called annotation because then I can also see not only the code portion, I can also see when was this modified last time by which commit. So if we talk about a problem, then we can see, well, when was it introduced? Super, super for reproducibility. And same functionality on GitLab. So GitLab has the same thing. I think maybe I don't need to show an example. You can also go in uh, and you can also get permalinks to source code. And I'm not sure you can have code portions, but you can at least reference code lines. Yeah, yeah this is now also yellow, and then you can get you can get a permalink up here. So oh, I I just saw in GitHub you if you select the first line and then you shift and click, then you can select the range more naturally without editing the URL yourself. Shift and click. Interesting. Okay, I'll learn something new. Mm -hmm. I was always editing and asking myself why is there not a better way. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> what so happens if you click? The... Yeah. What happens if you click the three dots there? Is it just permalink, or does it also do select range? No. This is now, uh, okay. this is now permalink to the range, mm. where you can. Yeah, but you can copy or reference a new issue. OK, yeah. So this is such mm. a nice, nice way. Now, now I can take that link, and I can email it, yeah. and we can talk about the code. Mm -hmm. Someone on. The HackMD says on GitHub, if you have the line selected, you can hit Y to automatically put the permalink with hash in the URL, which yeah, seems fine. useful. Oh, I will try this. Whoop. And then what was it? Shift something. And oh, no, what am uh, I supposed to do? Why? Why? Oh. Oh, yeah. that's pretty okay. cool. OK. Yeah, the hash mm. changed. OK. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I learned two new things. Neat. <laughs> Good. OK. Yeah. So back, back to Richard, who has also a little Git trick. Yeah. So? Yep. So uh, let me switch back to my screen. And here we are. So yeah, here I am in a repository. And <laughs> if I do git status, I see there's some files I would like to get ignore. So let's look at them. One is an editor backup file, which is uh, which is reasonable to put in the git ignore of this repository. Then I see .vm, which is uh, the virtual environment for here, which also could be reasonable to put in the git ignore file. But then this here is my own personal per directory bash history. So I have some hooks that whenever I change to a different directory, it will save the history within that own directory. And I wanted a way to ignore this per user. So it's not reasonable for me to put this into every single public project I have just because I have my own convention. So what I have here is in my home directory, tilde slash dot git ignore. If I look at it, I see, whoa, where did these lines come from? OK, maybe it's supposed to look like this. I have a feeling there's something fishy with my terminal here. OK, so there's bashist, and then my editor backup file, some Python files. That should be a dot. Whoa. OK, another editor backup file on this VM thing here. So there is a git configuration option. git config global uh, co config core.excludes file equals tilde slash dot git ignore. So when I run this, then nothing happens. And my shell definitely has something going wrong with it here. Um, could I have misspelled uh, something here? So I don't see the problem. Yeah. Yet. I mean, I don't understand the problem. Yeah. 
let's look at my get ignore again here. Uh, I wonder if nano is also something is seriously going wrong here. <laughs> I'm going to make a new shell and see what happens. Um, apparently all the new lines got lost somehow. Or actually maybe they got turned into some other character. Are you now in a different shell? Yeah. Because I'm not sure it's visible. Oh. Oh, oops. Uh, oh. Yeah, this opened in. Okay. Um, yeah, it. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, why? There we go. Uh... Yep, how it works. Okay. So. Yeah, I really wish I knew why this wasn't working. And what what we were trying to do because I was also I was writing somewhere else. So the yeah. but it didn't set it in the git config. Git config global core dot excludes file. Hmm. Uh, look, there's a the shell is returning false. Computer says no. Okay, I don't know what's wrong, but let's say I set it in here. So here I've uncommented it in order to make it live. And now here I am now, for every single one of my repositories, it ignores these files. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, I know what's wrong. There was, there's not supposed to be an equal sign here. Okay. I wrote it down wrong in my notes for the session. Okay. Well, wasn't that fun? <laughs> okay. Um, and Git had a really useless error message there. Precisely no error message. OK, so now this is ignored for every one of my repositories. So why would I use this versus putting it into the repository itself? And how do you think this relates to that? So for me, I think the most justifiable way of doing things would be each person excludes their own editor backup files in their own personal git ignore file and then in the uh like the global file or in the pro repository file then it ignores just the project files but in practice having some of the common editor excludes within the repository makes sense but for me, I had this very unique bash history thing that I wanted to exclude. So I just did it mm. here. It doesn't work well whenever git status appears clean to me, but then someone else takes my Python code and then runs it. And then the .pyc files start appearing for them and so on. Yeah, so I can see this useful. I have I'm collaborating with with colleagues, and then I, I see in some repositories a lot of the dot files which are about their own settings and their own editors, mm -hmm. and not really about the project itself. Yeah. So the second trick is uh, setting a shortcut URL for something. So let's see what would I do. Let me come up here. So there's some different GitHub organizations I use all the time. For example, Research Software Hour. And I would like to make an alias to make it faster to uh, clone from them. 
So I do git config global b global. So now I'm copying from my notes here. Of course, that didn't work very well last time, but let's see how it goes. URL dot git at dot com. So this, what you see here is the first part of an SSH URL for GitHub. So at the front, it's URL dot and afterwards instead of. So this looks sort of weird, but it's basically a config file with a value, config file option with in this section with a value of instead of. And then I do RSH colon like this. Um, so that you can use it as a shortcut instead yeah. of typing anything. So I can do git clone RSH, yeah, that is RSH very... notes, and then I already have it cloned, so I'll clone it into this new directory. And then there I go. Yeah, that's a power and, trick. And in my git config file towards the bottom, you see very many of these. So here's how you see it appears in the git config file URL this instead of this thing. There's also one for git push instead of and mm -hmm. which would make a different push URL than a pull URL. And you can see I have a lot of these defined, including some old ones here. And yeah, like I have one for GitHub in general. Also here, any GitHub HTTPS URL gets automatically mm -hmm. rewritten to the SSH URL, which is kind of nice. Oh, that's nice because that bit me often. Yeah. And if I look in, uh, in here, in this git config, we notice here the URL is defined using this placeholder also. So if sometime later I change what RSH is defined as, then this still gets updated. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've got indirection there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very nice. And if I do git remote-v, it shows where it actually mm -hmm. goes to. So yeah, these are some of my favorite mm -hmm. git config tricks, which save me quite a few keystrokes, I'd say. Yeah, I will, I will start using the second one for sure. Yeah. So Richard, now looking at the time, um, we wanted to talk about documentation, markdown versus RSD, but I think it I think it warrants a bit more than than the minus three minutes we have. Yeah. So, so should we do, do some maybe small questions and... Uh, yeah, I guess we can take some, um, yeah. Yeah, we could. Um, we would move the uh, documentation part to the next session because I think it's it's important. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so, any questions, comments? Any really hard uh, questions for us? Ask us something we can't answer. I'm also browsing here the HackMD just to make sure mm -hmm. we didn't miss anything. Yes. I also thought a bit more about the Zenodo and the fetch content. I think it should work because mm -hmm. I think you can fetch content from the tarball. I will try it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's also, I wonder if it's even worth fetching stuff from Zenodo or is that trying a little bit too hard to yeah. make things permanent when in practice PyPI is reasonable for, um, it's reasonably permanent anyway oh absolutely but this was maybe about like cmake projects mm -hmm. which, are, which you can put on mm -hmm. conda and you can also put them on pipei but it is a bit of work yeah so i've been struggling with that the past days is possible so you can really you can put compiled pre-compiled uh, packages up to pipei Or Kondo. Yeah. 
and we 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 well, I need to write write it up, and we sh we should have a, a future session on that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I see no more questions. Yeah. How was the session? Did you like the topics? Anything you'd like to do different next time? Are we going too advanced, too basic, too esoteric? Too slow, too fast. Should we also show this RSH notes repository? Yeah, I guess we can. You can, um, you can give me a screen share. Okay. There you go. It's uh, this place mm -hmm. issues. This is also a good place to give feedback, and it's also a place where we are collecting ideas. So you can also su suggest ideas. You can also suggest um, code that we should look over together. And we we have one suggestion here. Mm, yeah. Like so, we should. Here we have indication of how much time we think it will take. Mm -hmm. So it's also a good place to save ideas for a future session. Yeah. Thanks a lot for feedback on the chat, but also feedback on, on HackMD, really welcome. Yeah. Corrections, things we, we missed and didn't know. Well, I guess discussion isn't quite as lively today, so mm -hmm. that's fine too. Um, ah, a question is coming. Where the, uh, where the heck MD notes uploaded? Yeah, I can show that. Uh, oh, I, can, I still have the screen, yes. So, so on the website, on the website, here it is. So this is today's uh, session, but this is the one from last week, and we put them here. Mm -hmm. So here, questions, comments. I, I go through them, so maybe with, with some light editing to not have any names or something. But mm -hmm. which means that today's session, this is today's session here at the bottom of the document. I don't know. Uh, yeah, tomorrow they'll tomorrow. be added. Soon, I will, I will edit. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. snowing. Night it's snowing there. <laughs> not falling. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, call it a call it a session. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for everyone who watched, and we will see you next week. Thanks so much for watching, and thanks yeah. Richard for pulling this all together, and also mm -hmm. thanks to Simon for joining us today. Yes, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, see you all next week. Bye. Have a nice day, evening.